In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. I mentioned before I get my best uh, fiction reading in when I'm on vacation, and I can sort of uh, uh, tell how restful my vacation was by how much of that reading I get done. Uh, my pre previous trip to Europe wasn't the most restful, but it, uh, it did give me the opportunity to read a book uh, and I chose the book because its setting was both Germany uh, and France. Uh, it was called uh, All the Light We Cannot See. And I have to admit that the title of it itself sort of captured me, All the Light We Cannot See. Um, and I imagine that anyone who's read the book, the title of the book, uh, actually informs how they read the book. And it's a story set uh, before and during and then after uh, World War II, um, and uh, one of the main characters, uh, Werner, is uh, an orphan uh, growing up in a northern uh, coal town in, um, outside Berlin, Germany, and uh, he sees a limited trajectory for himself, except that he has an incredible gift. Uh, he has a mechanical mind, and he studies uh, how things work, and, um, and he and his sister have a fascination with radios. Uh, the world seems to come to them in ways that uh, their limited uh, affluence uh, wouldn't allow uh, through airwaves. Uh, in fact, they get uh, uh, airways um, and, and radio shows all the way from Paris, uh, and it expands their universe. And he's convict, convinced that uh, uh, he is going to grow up to be a scientist. Uh, and he gets so good at repairing these radios uh, that before long, people all over the town bring their radios to him to fix. Uh, and uh, during a time where uh, Germany was controlling uh, what kind of radio you can have and uh, what could be broadcast on it, uh, uh, people would, uh, in clandestine uh, uh, meetings, uh, bring their radios to him to fix. Uh, and at one particular time, a soldier uh, got wind of it, and, uh, uh, and his lady friend wanted the radio, um, uh, and so uh, he brings the radio to him to fix, and when he fixes it, uh, he begins to realize that there's probably more application uh, uh, for Werner's gift than just fixing radios uh, and gets him into an elite uh, Hitler Youth Academy uh, where he'll be able to put all of those gifts uh, uh, to use. And um, uh, he struggles with uh, the morality of it. His sister is a little bit uh, less gray in her understanding of things and, uh, and doesn't condone this at all, uh, but he sees this as a, a means to an end, a way for uh, an orphan with uh, no connections to be able to fulfill a dream uh, after the war is long since over. Um, and there's a complexity to his story that develops from there. And then the other story that takes place uh, in a parallel world, uh, a country away, uh, is uh, Marie, uh, a, a girl who is uh, uh, born with uh, 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 an ailment that will uh, soon take her sight. Uh, and her father, who is the uh, locksmith or head of security uh, for the, uh, 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 the natural... Uh, the, the Natural History Museum in Paris, uh, and he is determined to make sure uh, that she doesn't live in fear, that she doesn't live in a closed box that her blindness uh, 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 casts for herself. And so uh, he creates, uh, with, with his woodworking skills, the most uh, intricate uh, replication of their neighborhood in Paris. Every building, uh, every uh, possible uh, landmark uh, is made into this model, and uh, he brings each one to her, uh, and she slowly memorizes the entire uh, city, uh, especially where she'll travel the most, until she's able to go outside uh, and walk it, knowing uh, the familiarity uh, that she has with that model. Uh, and uh, it's beautiful to watch the way this, uh, this father is preparing his daughter uh, uh, for, for life uh, beyond uh, maybe uh, his ability to be there with her, uh, and then the other people from the, uh, uh, the museum that, that, that help her uh, thrive. And she eventually has to flee Paris uh, during the uh, occupation, uh, but these two stories uh, capture a couple things. One, uh, with Werner, we're, we're dealing with the story that we've been uh, confronted with for the last two weeks. How much are we a product? How much freedom do we have uh, to be apart from the environment that we have? How much can we be conformed by the society we live in, and how much freedom do we have to be transformed by something greater? Uh, how much does Werner have to fall into line uh, with the Nazi regime, and how much can he keep 
uh, the person that he is uh, amidst the difficult times that he finds himself, against the difficult nationality of which he was born? Uh, how does he uh, hold these things in tension? And how does he find goodness uh, amidst a, a place that seems uh, fairly dark? Uh, and so there's the question of freedom and the ability to uh, not be conformed by this, uh, this world uh, that we, we struck in the epistle and then in the gospel today. Uh, and then there's also uh, the title. All the light we cannot see. How do we find light amidst darkness? How do we find holy ground uh, where there doesn't seem to be anyone? And as the backdrop for this, uh, for this uh, book is, um, uh, is all of the ills of, of the war taking place, uh, the violence done to one another, the, uh, the Holocaust, uh, the difficult decisions uh, that different people are called to make, uh, how do we find moments of goodness, moments of grace, uh, little bits of light shining amidst the darkness? And it's not a triumphant story, uh, but it's an honest story about the fact that uh, sometimes we have to look pretty closely uh, to see light. Um, uh, but there is light. Uh, there's light and there's goodness and there's connection and there is holy ground uh, everywhere we look. Uh, and I, I couldn't help but think of that um, of that story uh, as we have Moses' journey and some of the other things playing out today. Um, and we have Moses who uh, in one week goes from being a little baby uh, in a basket uh, to a, a full-grown man on the run. Uh, uh, it just switches right over from one chapter to the next to him being fully grown. Um, and it goes straight to the account uh, where he witnesses uh, an Egyptian uh, uh, being uh, brutally mistreating uh, a, a slave, uh, an Israelite slave. And as soon uh, as he's alone with this Egyptian uh, he, he decides to take his life. He decides to kill him. Um, and then the next day, uh, as he's breaking up a quarrel between two Israelites, um, he realizes that, uh, that, that word has spread about him killing uh, this uh, uh, Egyptian that he's, he's, he's uh, dug in the sand. And so he flees to Midian, um, and um, he, he marries, and he uh, takes a job while he's on the, uh, the run uh, tending uh, to his father-in-law's uh, sheep. Um, are, are heard, and uh, while he's there, uh, Moses, who is somewhat broken at this moment in his life, uh, has this incredible moment that has been etched in time uh, and place, uh, uh, this moment where this, this incredible image of God comes in this uh, bush that catches fire but won't be consumed, uh, and the voice of God speaks to him and says, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. Uh, and, and tells him, you're the one uh, for whom uh, uh, my people will be freed. And he, he also says, uh, he says, I'm the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob. I'm the God that's always been. Uh, and I suffer for my people. I ache for my people. I hear their cries. I see their imprisonment. Uh, and I want their liberation. Uh, he's the God of all that's been. Uh, and then at the end, as Moses is feeling incredible sense of unworthiness uh, because of all the darkness in his own life, uh, he says, well, well, even if I were to do this, who would I say sent me? Uh, nobody, uh, nobody knows who you are. Who are you? And he says, I am who I am. And in Hebrew, there's, there's not necessarily a tense associated with it. So it could also be translated, I will be who I will be. I am the God who was with my people in their crying and in their tears. I am the God who is in the waters uh, of Houston, Texas. I am the God who is always with you. I am the God who always was, always is, and always will be. I am who I am. And he takes that out into the world. And he goes and he tells the people that there's hope, that there's light, that there is a God who has never abandoned them, no matter how dark things seemed. I can't help but be struck by that as we look at two images that have sort of consumed our, our news cycle over the last several weeks, uh, the disconnect between the two, uh, the violence and the hatred and, and all that was spewed in, in, in Charlottesville and other places, and then the uh, devastation in Houston, but also uh, the sense of connectedness, the sense of a, uh, a deep understanding of, of, of our universal family coming together healing one another, rescuing one another. Uh, when I think of sacred ground, I can't help but, but think of, and I've talked about it before, uh, how sacred I find those uh, waters of baptism to be. Uh, that that story where Jesus is baptized, to me, is the sacramental uh, 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 
uh, understanding that God is in all of it. And having stood a year or so ago at the foot of, uh, of the River Jordan and seeing uh, how insignificant and how murky and how uh, unspecial it is, uh, and Jesus, who was without sin, being willing to enter into those waters that everybody has gone in to wash all the things they've done wrong, all of their brokenness, uh, that John uh, the Baptist has, has rinsed every sin into those waters, uh, and that those are the dirtiest waters, metaphorically, physically, and otherwise, uh, and Jesus enters into it to say, this is holy ground. There is light in this darkness. I am in the midst of all of it. And so as the flood waters rose in Houston, uh, and as I uh, looked uh, and researched Houston, I discovered uh, that in the last five or six years, it has uh, statistically become, uh, according to, depends on what statistics you use, the most diverse country in America. It's past New York is the most diverse country in America. Uh, and some of the images uh, that have come out of, uh, of that devastation certainly echo that truth, that there is light in the darkness, uh, that there is uh, moments of grace, that there is holy ground, that there is a sense uh, of us being one family, uh, that God, through the hands of people who look different, who come from different neighborhoods, uh, who have different color skin, who have different stories, uh, reaching out to one another, that God indeed has been in the midst of that. And that even... In the darkness, there is light. And I think that that's important for us as Christians to understand that we have both obligations. We have the obligation to call out injustice, uh, to, to stomp out hatred uh, and brokenness. But we also have that responsibility to see light and to call out light when there is light, especially amidst the darkness. To do what the psalmist calls us to do and to seek the face of God. And there's been many faces of God, many of God's servants uh, in those waters. And God has been in the midst of those waters. And maybe in that, there's signs of light and healing taking place. I also think of the epistle for today and the way that it uh, frames the way that we are to care for one another. Love what is good. Hate what is evil. And it doesn't say hate evil people. It says, hate what is evil. In fact, later on, it talks about not meeting evil with evil, about leaving things up to God, but hate what is evil. Love our brothers and sisters. Reach out a hand for our brothers and sisters. Be people who are called to see light. See, as Jesus challenges Peter, not just of human minds, not just of minds of this world, uh, but of things godly. If we deal with all the things in our own life, all the things that are swirling around, uh, I invite you to look for light. As I was thinking about this, I uh, read the reflection that Richard Rohr has a daily reflection. Uh, and today's reflection was about light and dark and says one of the things that's killing the church is the uh, hypocrisy or the lack of the church being willing to acknowledge uh, that there's darkness in every human institution. The people come to church expecting nothing but light, uh, and when they find darkness, uh, they leave. Or the way that we've created these dichotomies uh, that, that are not sustainable. The, the honest truth is that there's darkness and there's light. And we're called to hold on to the light, to seek the face of God to find luminal moments where God is present, where we stand with our feet off on sacred ground saying, this this is God's place. God is present amongst us here. And it's not always in cathedrals or beautiful churches. And it's not always in the waters. When the waters recede, those same neighborhoods that people have flocked to, God was present before, now, and in the future. Our eyes are just a little bit more attuned right now. So I call us as Christians to look at all the light we cannot see. And there we'll find God. Amen.